Hi, this will be just a relatively uh, quick follow-up video to my previous mailbag one where um, LD from uh, techbox.net uh, sent in this very nice uh, line impedance stabilization network which is used for EMC pre-compliance testing for in particular uh, conducted uh, measurements instead of radiated uh, measurements which we'll get into. So I thought I'd do a quick video showing you how to do some rudimentary pre-compliance testing with one of these uh, line impedance stabilization networks or listens um, and a, a cheap bottom of the range Rigol uh, DSA 815 spectrum analyzer. Now uh, pre-compliance testing is a big deal for um, anyone really, any manufacturer manufacturing any electronic product that you want to sell in the commercial market in pretty much um, any country in the world, at least if you you know care about uh, doing it legally and correct. And you've probably seen these symbols around, this uh, CE mark and this FCC mark here, and in Australia this uh, CTIC symbol here. Now. Uh, different countries have various standards. The CE standard, this is um, EMC compliance, electromagnetic uh, conformity. Basically, in the European uh, Union, have that standard. In uh, America, it's the FCC. In Australia, it's this uh, CTIC compliance standard. So depending on where you want to sell your product into what markets, um, you may have to uh, test your product against these various standards to get this mark on your product and uh, it can cost thousands to tens of thousands of dollars to get your uh, product tested. So you've designed your widget like this uh, mains plug pack here and you you know you've done all the proper design um, uh, rules and you know what you're doing and you're pretty sure it's not going to radiate much and uh, you know it's not going to be susceptible to outside interference even if you care um, and you know you go to get the thing EMC compliance tested and wah, mm, fail, you forgot something and it's failed the um, very stringent uh, requirements or very specific requirements for any one of these particular things. There are more standards than this of course and it depends on the type of product which we won't go into. Uh, the, the details are, are enormous but uh, when you design your product if you fail that pre-compliance testing uh, sorry, not pre-compliance, proper compliance testing, then you'll have to re-spin your product, or figure out what's wrong first, and then re-spin your product and get it tested again. And to do that over and over again on a trial and error basis is a real pain in the ass. So any smart company will what's do called uh, in uh, pre-compliance testing, and you can do that in-house with, as I said, one of these uh, line... Uh, impedance stabilization networks for conducted measurements and a cheap ass spectrum analyzer which you can get these days like this Rigol one. But there are several types of emissions that uh, your product can actually uh, emit. So we have to talk about those quickly because we're only going to look at one today. Now I've got this diagram from uh, Wikipedia. Thank you very much, uh, Steel Pillow, because it quite nicely illustrates the four different uh, coupling, noise coupling, uh, or emissions coupling mechanisms from your device here, which will uh, call the source. One of the major ones, of course, which everyone thinks of uh, when they think of, you know, EMC uh, compliance and things like that, is what's called radiative emissions and you're probably familiar with this you know your pro electronic product has lots of switching frequencies in there very uh, fast sharp digital signals uh, which uh, emit very you know broadband uh, radiative you know noise emissions and things like that so you know pretty much any product unless it's completely sealed in a metal can with nothing coming in nothing coming out and the metal cans are hundred percent effective uh, over the whole frequency range, the, or the desired frequency range, then pretty much your product is going to radiate electromagnetic interference out. All those little PCB traces, everything inside, acting as little antennas, and woof, out it comes. And we're not going to look at this one today, but that is the one of that is the major one that everyone thinks about and is a big deal with EM. C compliance, but the other one fewer people know about is uh, conductive emissions, and many products will have to be tested for conductive emissions as well. And this is what we'll cover today. There are two others, of course. There's capacitive uh, coupling from your source to your victim over here, as it's called, and there's also inductive coupling as well. But because inductive and capacitive coupling are near field effects, uh, pretty much they are only uh, cover. They're only required. 
uh, to meet some sort of standard in very specific cases for products. So most products will not be tested for these near field effects, but they will be tested for radiate, radiative uh, interference and uh, or emissions and conductive emissions. So even if your product was battery powered like this inside a nice die cast metal chassis like this and you know it's got the lid sealed on and everything well in theory um, then you wouldn't have any radiated uh, emissions or conducted emissions because there's no cables coming in and out of it but that's not a very useful product is it usually there's got to be cutouts for screens and things like that so it can actually radiate signals out or in this case even if we had something like this and it was completely shielded like that bingo we've just broken that shield with our BNC here and noise from inside any switching noise can couple onto the signal and onto the coax and bingo out it comes and that's called conductive emissions because it's conducting along the copper cables into and out of your product and take for example the uh, plug mains plug back here if this could this could be completely metal shielded uh, till the cows come home and you know it may not have any radiative uh, em emissions uh, to speak of really but you've got the mains cable coming in and you've got the DC power cable coming out so in that case if this was completely shielded for radiative stuff your conductive stuff could kill you and you might fail your compliance testing so to do conductive pre-compliance testing we need one of these uh, listens or line impedance stabilization network and I'll explain why it's called that in a second this one is from uh, TechBox and uh, sent it in it is open source hardware brilliant and here's the schematic I'll provide the link down below and you can buy it from them or you can make your own so what this is designed to do is insert in series with your power cable coming in and your power uh, comes in here and then this end here plug well this end these two terminals plug into your product and what it does is it AC couples off the signal into your spectrum analyzer there and this inductive filter here basically provides a fixed impedance hence the name line impedance stabilization network because Basically, your supply over here is an unknown impedance. You don't know what that's uh, going to be. It could vary or whatever. It's no good, especially when you're doing uh, standards testing, if your source varies. So uh, all these uh, compliance testing standards specify a specific 50 ohm network like this. So this is what it does. This provides a fixed 50 ohm uh, line impedance that you can do a controlled testing over um, over a specific frequency range which we'll uh, see in a minute and it just taps off the AC signal and a good listen device like this one will also contain that surge suppression as well we've got some uh, 5 volt uh, TVS diodes in here to protect our spectrum analyzer from any surges on the power supply here and there's a gas discharge tube and a mob over here so it's pretty well protected otherwise you've got to be careful when you power up your product if it's connected to your delicate uh, RF input of your spectrum analyzer here you know how it's always got that uh, you know maximum uh, value this one's pretty good at uh, you know 50 volts at DC maximum but some of them you got to be real careful you don't blow your expensive spectrum analyzer and there are various uh, standards for these line impedance stabilization networks one of them is the uh, CISPA standard here and you can see that uh, the standard actually provides um, what the uh, impedance of this uh, listen network is supposed to be here's the upper and lower limits and you can see this one is actually designed to fit you know fairly much in the middle of that so this one actually meets the requirements so having a standards compliant listen box like this absolutely essential for any uh, conductive emissions pre-compliance testing now a proper EMC compliance uh, test facility will have all a proper uh, shielded room to do all this in they'll thoroughly meet the requirements they know what they're doing but if you're doing simple pre-compliance in your lab then uh, you know this is a basic uh, best practice way to do it and the standards do actually uh, specify this and dimensions and things like that but you start out with basically a horizontal and a vertical uh, ground plane at the very least you should be using a horizontal ground plane like this with your device under test um, up on an insulated wood and oh, well, some sort of you know insulated uh, table like this there are as I said uh, uh, 
standards for, you know, it must be X distance away from the planes and, you know, things like that. But at least one horizontal ground plane on the bottom, you don't necessarily have to use the vertical one. These ground planes just stop capacitive coupling to uh, other uh, devices and uh, things like that in the room. And then you've got your listen device down here, very short, low impedance coupling because if that's a high impedance if you use a big long lead on there um, then you know that isn't a very good uh, grounding uh, point over the frequency range so it has to be very short very closely connected to that ground plane device under test isolated and then you tap off to your spectrum analyzer in a proper emc uh, facility this would be outside of the shielded uh, chamber and things like that, but we won't go into details. All right, now what we're going to test here very simply, very crude me, so don't hold me to task over this, okay? It's just an example of pre compliance, uh, basic pre compliance testing. Little uh, USB charger, one of these crappy little USB chargers in a non shielded box, so it's going to be radiating stuff, but of course, we're only going to be uh, testing the conducted emissions of this thing and I've got myself a ground plane although in this instance it's really not going to matter uh, much at all you can do it uh, basic testing without a ground plane and we've got a power supply up here there we go that uh, powers our uh, 12 volts goes into uh, the source part of our uh, listen box here and we've got our coax coming out to our spectrum analyzer there, Rigold DSA 815, and we'll show you how to set that up. And uh, this just uh, mounted above the ground plane here by a certain amount, otherwise you just rip out the ground plane and put it on the bench. And I've got the ground, the source point of, you don't want to ground this side here, you want to ground the source side to your grounding plate on the bottom. So that's the setup. Now I'll show the spectrum analyzer setup in a minute, but uh, as you can see, we are getting a spike here. Now I've got it uh, disconnected, so it's not uh, powered at all, but it is, you know, still connected uh, through to the uh, device under test side of this. And you'll notice that we're getting a spike here. That's a, um, we're going from 150 kilohertz to uh, 30 megahertz span at the moment. So that's like, you know, 25 megahertz or something. And if I disconnect this, we'll find that the, there we go, it uh, vanishes. So that now with disconnected, we can get ourselves a baseline. Although you can see how at the low end over here, it is, uh, we do have some noise right down at the low end there. And if we disconnect our coax from our listen device, there we go, that's our noise floor. So you can take that noise floor as a reference and actually uh, subtract that out later if you want to, but we're not going to bother with that today. Alright, so here's how to crudely set up our spectrum analyzer for this basic pre-compliance testing. It will, of course, depend entirely upon your uh, device under test, your test setup, what version of the standard you're using, etc, etc. But I'll show you a basic one. Uh, basic one would be 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz frequency range. So the first thing we want to do is go into frequency there. Uh, the start frequency, we want 150 kilohertz down there, and our stop frequency is 30 megahertz already set up. Now, we also want to go into our bandwidth detect there, and our resolution bandwidth, we want to go into that, so there it is. Uh, currently set to 9 kilohertz, that's what we want it set to for this uh, basic frequency range. Now, the filter type here, uh, Gaussian or EMI, uh, this actually... This spectrum analyzer has a specific EMI filter which we want to use if we have it. I think it might even be an, a software optional extra, but you don't necessarily have to do that if you're using the uh, Gaussian uh, filter, as we'll see in a minute. And if we're going to amplitude, we don't want any input attenuator at all at this stage, so we'll leave that set to 0 dB. And the other really important thing is our detector type there. Uh, you, for a very quick uh, first pass measurements, you want to send it to positive peak there. Quasi peak is what we're going to do for more uh, detailed measurements of this thing, which uh, takes a lot longer to um, scan and give you a result. But the positive peak, that's what we want with our EMI filter if you have it. And what that positive peak detection type is going to do is basically going to give you the worst case at each uh, frequency point, the worst case value, and that's really all we care about, you know, does it go over the limit or not? That's pretty much it. Now, for the CISPA standard uh, EMI testing, the units are always going to be in dB microvolts, so we want that set up, so our vertical scale there is uh, 
0 dB reference point is 1 microvolt. So, for example, if we're getting 1 millivolt, a signal was 1 millivolt in amplitude, then that would be 60 dB above up there. So our reference lines down there, this is our inherent uh, noise floor of our spectrum analyzer setup here, and I think we're ready to go. Almost. Now one thing we can do to see if we're uh, passing or failing a basic limit is to set a reference level up here to show us whether or not we're past failing. We can do that on this spectrum analyzer. All spectrum analyzers are different. Some will have it, some won't. I can go into trace pass fail here. I've already uh, set it up so I won't bore you with the details but I'll turn it on and basically it gives us a reference line there and the uh, CISPR 25 standard, uh, uh, just a generic uh, one won't go into details, but it's basically one millivolt uh, reference level across this particular frequency range. So one millivolt, um, as the example I used before, is 60 dB. So uh, we want to go into the setup there, and you can edit these uh, data points and the amplitude there. There it is, uh, 60 dB is our reference level at the upper and lower frequencies. So it draws a straight line. You can actually set like an envelope in there, but we just want a straight line, basically. So here's our waveform, and that if it goes over, when we turn this thing on, if our signal goes over that purple line there, wah, wah, warning Will Robinson, where uh, we could be exceeding our limit. So this spectrum analyzer pass-fail thing is actually quite uh, good. We can go in there, set upper and lower limits, but as you can see, I've got um, 60 dB, which is the 1 millivolt dB microvolts, which is the 1 millivolt uh, level uh, crewed by the standard here, and we can set those at both points. And now we are ready to go. We're ready to turn this sucker on. So here's our noise floor. I'll connect my coax to the listen device and still have not applied power and you can see that right at the low frequency down in there it's jumped up and you can go have a look at that but anyway here we go I've got a uh, 12 volt supply here I'm going to plug in my USB charger and let's see what we get once again from 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz with our uh, CISPR 25 standard limit of 1 millivolt plug her in ta-da look at that uh, once again, we got that peak that we uh, saw before, and you can see there's a bit more broadband noise up at the high end there, you know, that 20 to 30 megahertz uh, region up there, but, you know, there's the standard, so, you know, we're well below that. Look, and I'll, dis I'll disconnect my coax again so you can see that. So you can see that's our noise floor of our system, and then... Well, it jumped up just a bit at the high end, but what really concerns us is this low end down here, which is above that purple line. So we're in trouble down at the low frequency, down at, you know, the hundreds of kilohertz to a megahertz range. So we want to zoom into that and see what's happening. So I've got my marker there, and, uh, oh, you probably can't see it, four, it's obscuring it a bit, a bad position in there, but, you know, four megahertz, something like that. So it's up to a couple of megahertz. There's my marker point, so 2 megahertz, so let's go from say 0 to 5 or something like that and we'll be able to see that down there. So we'll go into frequency and our stop frequency will change that to 5 megahertz and now we can get in there and we can see. Now you can see that, you know, it's not, it, we're getting close to our limit but the average value in there is not, you know, hugely above that line. We're close and a couple of peaks are going over. Now it's time um, because this is a very quick update in using that positive peak detector. Now we want to go into our quasi uh, detector. So we'll go here and we'll go into our quasi peak detector and this one will actually take some time. Twiddle our thumbs, but we'll eventually get a result. And the problem there was if we go into a sweep but set it to uh, 970 seconds. That's why we're going to have to wait a while. And if we set it manually to 60 seconds, we can see it uh, start sweeping across here, but this isn't going to be accurate. So that is uh, certainly going to take a while. As you can see, we've gotten this far after, well, two and a half minutes. It's going to take about 16 minutes to do that in entire sweep at the recommended uh, value of the uh, sweep speed of 970 seconds there. That one took a bit of time, so what I've done is I've uh, changed my frequency range from uh, 0 hertz to 1 megahertz here, and that's giving me a uh, sweep time, auto uh, sweep time of uh, 200 seconds, much more reasonable. And as you can see, we are, uh, with the uh, quasi uh, peak detector, we are going above our line there, our reference line, and you notice our reference line 
um, jumps up there. That's because I set it to 150 kilohertz. I should have set it to zero, and it would have gone all the way across. But anyway, um, the uh, range, as far as the standard is concerned, is only from, a, in this particular case, is 150 kilohertz upwards. So even up to a megahertz here, as you can see, we're basically still over that nominal uh, CISPA uh, limit. So really, um, we probably want to take it out to a couple of, hundred, uh, couple of megahertz again and uh, see where it actually falls below that. But we're definitely uh, pushing our luck here, that's for sure, with this design. And I should point out that something like this uh, cheap, low-end uh, general purpose spectrum analyzer isn't quite going to give exactly the same results as a proper EMC house would with their $15,000 you know, EMC uh, measurement receiver. But, you know, we can get a reasonable indication, and that's the whole idea that this thing allows you to do uh, some basic in house testings, um, you know, cheap and easily. Basically, it's just your time inside the house plus a, you know, a $1,500 or less uh, analyzer, not much at all. And you can do this uh, basic testing, and most importantly, you can actually test things before and after you make changes to the product. So we're almost there for a 300 megahertz span using a quasi peak detect here. And as you can see, it's starting to drop off there and I can set a marker here. Where's our marker value? So anything sort of uh, that point there, sorry, it's a bit hard to see with the tiny little font on this thing. But um, anyway, around about, you know, 2.5. Three, let, let's say uh, 2.5 megahertz and under, that's where we've, we're probably going to be a bit concerned about uh, that sort of stuff. So we might want to look at our design and go, well, what can we improve down at that low end? But uh, as we saw with the wider frequency sweep before, anything like above that 2.5 megahertz, um, so it just uh, drops off and it seems to be just fine. And there it is, exactly the same shot, but back in the uh, real time there. So we're a bit concerned here with our pre-compliance testing down at the low frequency here. You know, there's a good chance we may not pass the standard here. And what can we do about it? Let's say this thing, oh, it's got to ship next week. You know, we can't re-spin this board and add, you know, uh, ferrites on the output and uh, do other stuff to reduce the EMI. You know, change the uh, slew rate of signals inside, tighten up the PCB layout, all that uh, sort of stuff. What can we do? Well, we can probably try adding on one of these um, uh, ferrites, one of these external clamp type uh, ferrites. You may have seen these on uh, products. And these are a common technique for just this thing where, well, your product's finished. Oh, no, but we failed our compliance testing. We still want to ship this thing. So what you can do is just add a couple of these to your uh, power wires on the output. You may have seen them, and they may have been like a heat shrunk on the outside, for example, added after the fact to make your product pass that EMC compliance. So let's see if it makes a difference. Here's our live display here, and uh, let me clamp it over once, and we probably, with only one, so we've only got like one turn in there, we really don't expect to see any different, any drop at all in that, right? Not much at all, but if we wrap it around that a couple of times, on just this one lead here, I think we might be in luck. So there you go, I've got a couple of turns inside that thing, and bingo, look, it's dropped us down a hell of a lot. You can see that by adding an extra turn in there, we're almost under, even right down at the bottom end there, so we're doing pretty good. Let's add another one to the negative line here. All right, here we go, let's see if we can see this change live. I'll just clamp this over on my negative line there, and look at that, oh, beauty. So that's not exactly the uh, best solution to your problem here. If you can fix it inside your product, you uh, certainly would if you had the time to, uh, you know, re-spin. That's why you do the in-house testing. The in-house uh, pre-compliance testing at the design stage, at the prototype stage, allows you to get a quick ballpark indication of whether or not you're going to pass this, um, will pass EMC compliance, whether or not you're on the border. And when you're doing simple bench testing like this, even the ground plane isn't going to uh, save you really. Just be careful about external uh, electromagnetic fields here, which can uh, you know radiate into your test system. That's why these things are done in proper uh, shield enclosures, things like that. We're just mucking around here on the bench doing some basic testing. As we've seen before, my LED lights above me that I use for shooting, watch this, if I get rid of them, We'll probably see this higher end broadband noise disappear.
or lower. Look, look, look at that. And I switch it. That spike is still there. Switch it on and see. So just be careful about what things are radiating into your test system here or capacitive or inductive coupling. Just be aware of it. And if you're wondering, does this metal shield make a big difference in this particular installation? No, not really. Let me remove it live here. Oh, there we go. A bit more higher uh, broadband noise there, but, you know, essentially it's not going to uh, change the issue that we had at the lower end. And, of course, uh, radiated testing would be a whole different uh, ball game again, and that requires a... Uh, calibrated antenna which you connect up to your spectrum analyzer and a shielded um, anechoic room. I've done uh, videos on, on those before, those um, indoor uh, test sites for EMC compliance, which I should link in down below actually. But this one was just a basic video to show you how you can do some basic uh, conducted pre-compliance measurements and the good thing is is that you can do these measurements even though if they're not you know absolutely correct to the absolute value you can see if you're getting anywhere close to the standard uh, to the standards limit or not and if you are then you can make changes to your product and then rerun the exact same test setup in house doesn't cost you much to uh, spin a new design and add a little you know like you might put some little ferrite beads in there you might do this or that you might shield this or that or do something and uh, to and then you can see the changes that in your product what they make to your uh, conducted and your radiated emissions um, as well so it's really you know one of those vital things in-house EMC pre-compliance because it's much cheaper to do it in-house at the design stage than it is to get a report back what failed so there you go there's a very brief look at uh, some basic in-house EMC pre-compliance testing and don't please don't take this video as uh, gospel because there the standard is incredibly complex and it depends a hell of a lot on your device under test and all sorts of stuff so you know and the test setups and the uh, frequency range and the type and your product and the different classes of uh, product that you can have within the uh, standard so this might be you know a class 4 or a class 3 standard or something like that depending on what uh, value it actually meets and the market you intend to sell into and etc etc but anyway um there's I'm sure a lot of people with uh, a ton of EMI um, EMC experience will uh, no doubt point out some uh, really good links on the uh, forum and in the comments so if you do have those please uh, add them hope you enjoyed it catch you next time